he lays down and goes to shoot and realizes he has no ammo. Then I realize I'm way over here and realize I have this entire box of ammo. Uh, we'd like to ask you that you point the barrels of your automatic rifles towards the floor in case of an accidental discharge. Really, you will never hear that again being announced on a plane. <laughs> We weren't back for an hour when the call came in that uh, one of our platoons got ambushed. So we're rolling and we're trying to find our way, but every so often we'd come to a dead end. Either tires would be burning or there'd be a car stalled in the road, and so we turn around. So we started taking heavier fire and then it's just like everyone in the city was shooting at us. Uh, and I had my saw, which has a scope on it, and I just leaned down, clicked over a couple spots on the scope, and, and when he popped his head up to check see if he hit anything, I put three across his forehead. I was in the Bradley maybe 15 minutes when it got hit by two RPGs. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll go get you a saw because we need volunteers to go back out. And I said, I'll go. He's like, well, I'll be right back. So he comes back and puts a saw down at the end of the ramp. He said, if you can walk to it, it's yours. You can come back out. I took two steps and face planted on the ramp and slid down. Wow. He said, yeah, you're not going out. <laughs> <laughs> Went through a period of being suicidal. Didn't because of my dog. I know, I've met other vets that I have nothing in common with, and I know that since they're a vet or they're active duty, I can count on them for my life, and they can do the same. It doesn't matter what war, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, it doesn't matter. Once you've served, you're part of a brotherhood that's thicker than any family because you will die for that other person, and you know they will for you too. It's just who we are. Hi, my name is Jim Batchelor. I uh, was born in Dallas, and uh, I, I pretty much grew up in the area around Dallas and then moved down to the country when I was a little older. I uh, joined the Army in August of 2001, uh, pretty much because I was in college and kind of found something that was more entertaining than uh, going to school. I had my first college girlfriend. And, that pretty much took my GPA from a 4.0 to a 1.2 because uh, she was far more interesting than uh, uh, chemistry. <laughs> so uh, I, I went to a recruiter and got to be friends with him and I initially was going to go in for JAG. I wanted to be a JAG officer. I wanted to be an attorney. And he said, no problem. Took me down to MEPS, put me in a room, and I'm sitting there filling out the paperwork at MEPS. And then this... Uh, Found out later he was a staff sergeant. Come in. He said, uh, what job do you want? I said, oh, I'm going to be Jackie. He goes, funny. What do you mean? He said, only women work in JAG offices. But, uh, you know, I can understand you being scared to be a man. What? He said, I'll, t I'll tell you what, Sally. You just go ahead and, you know, file your nails. I'm going to put on a tape for the next man who walks in here. And, uh, you know, just ignore it. What it was was the ranger training video that I was a sucker for because you, uh, it starts out with big letters saying, so you want to be a ranger? I was like, yeah. Okay, whatever. I'll go back to my paperwork. And then it shows him kicking down doors and going down the river on a Zodiac looking up with booty caps doing this number and Black Hawks and the fun stuff. And I was like, wow, that looks kind of cool. He comes back in there with a Coke. He's like, I told you not to watch that. That's for men. He's like, dude, tell me about that. He goes, first thing, I'm not a dude. And second thing, that's a ranger. You'll never be a ranger because you're filing your nails. He said, matter of fact, we need rangers so much, we offer them a $20,000 signing bonus. I'm like, 20 grand, you say? <laughs> and I get to do that? He said, yeah. I, like, I want to do that instead. And he says, really? You, you think you got what it takes? Yeah, I can do that. So he 
leaves, comes back with a different slip of paper and hands it to me, and I sign up for infantry ranger contract. I should have known at that point that I'm not that smart because I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, and when I told my recruiter what I had done, he said, please don't tell your mom and tell her I had nothing to do with it. She'll kill me. Because he had met her. My mom's a very intimidating person. And, and so I told her the first thing she did was drive up there and climb over his desk after him. And my mom is now in her 70s. Uh, so, yeah, she's spry. <laughs> I'm still scared of her. Uh, but August 21st was my report date to Fort Benning, Georgia. I flew into uh, Atlanta from DFW. I was the, uh, quote, team leader to make sure that all the people who were meeting in DFW got to Atlanta okay. So I had my little checklist. I did that, and of course it kind of gave me a big head because look, I'm important. No. <laughs> fell, uh, fell asleep on the bus from Atlanta to Fort Benning. Woke up to a guy getting on the bus screaming about how it was his bus. We should get the hell off it. What I didn't know was he was ranked less than I was. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you have somebody yelling at you to get the hell off their bus. Get the hell off their bus. So there wasn't even places for us to sleep, so we slept in the auditorium for two hours till chow the next morning, and that pretty much started it. Um, that was August 21st. Two weeks later, we're still in holdover, waiting to go down range to our unit uh, to start training, and then September 11th happens. And then they start in on us with, every one of you are going to get trained with a rifle, and then we're sending you to Afghanistan. Great. I've been in the Army a total of two weeks. What? This isn't supposed to happen. When I joined, there was nothing going on. This is what I signed up for. Nothing. I went out. They're like, no, we're going to train you. But they took us down range, and they basically put me in a ranger platoon. Again, it's a real ego trip to be in a ranger platoon, but you run harder than everyone else because you get that little X on the end of your... MOS, 11 X-ray. So they ran us, they trained us to work together, and that if one of you screws up, all of you take the fall for it. Uh, there were some instances that they set us up for failure on purpose. Like um, one of the guys had a can of dip. We got caught with it, correction, he got caught with it, but the drill sergeant didn't want to tell us who it was. And he said, tell you what, if, uh, y'all tell on, I don't want the person to step out, if y'all tell on the person who did this, then I'll just punish them and the rest of y'all can have a day off. And we all looked at each other and we're like, no. He, he gave us two hours to sit there and think over it. He left. And we're all like, dude, what the hell, man? He goes, nah. I told him I did it. He said, y'all just admit that I did it and then, you know, y'all are off and I'll just get smoked and it's no problem. He come back up, he said, alright, who did it? And we're all like, we all did it. He said, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, it's all of ours. We just took turns passing it around. He's like, this little can here. Roger, drill sergeant. All right, so all of us went downstairs, got two sandbags each, brought them back upstairs. He cut them open and poured them up and down the bays and took two canteens of water and spread it in it so it's mud. He took seven cans of kiwi and ground it into the uh, linoleum. He said, I expect that done by the morning and left. This was like... 6.30 at night, and we spent all night cleaning cleaning up and buffing it out and polishing the floors, and you come back up the next morning, 5.30 formation, huh, they're gonna clean. By the way, good job. Uh, Y'all burned together, so yeah, good job. And he made us hate him. I learned later that that builds, you know, trust with each other, is Absolutely. everybody burning together. And that pretty much set the entire tempo for my entire basic training. Um, I fractured my ankle in, in basic, so I didn't get to go to the ranger training. And when they told me, they said, you know, if you quit at this point, uh, you know, you're letting everyone down. I said, I, I can't. I said, Fine. And the 
colonel in charge was yelling at me. He had a big knot right here. And he said, what are you looking at? You're looking at me like a dick run out of my forehead. And I said, well, <laughs> sir, you know, <laughs> oh, you think you're funny. Well, that little sense of humor cost me a year in Korea on the DMZ. I spent really? a year sitting on the DMZ at, Fort, uh, at Camp Graves, rather. Uh, no women, 50 acre base, three hours from anything. We really didn't get time off. We spent uh, at least three weeks out of the month in the field. I was a Humvee driver, which was kind of cool because we technically had heat in our vehicles and it technically kept us dry when it rained. That's a lot of technicals. And it never works out that way. <laughs> so after after Kent Graves, uh, I became two sergeants pet as I was overweight. Hard to believe I know. Uh, but they made me their pet, so they run me all the time. And they're like, you know, you're fat and slow, but you got a lot of heart. We like that in you, but we're still gonna fuck with you. So. That's how I thought the army was, was uh, Korea, you know, you sleep in your team leader's room because he's fucking with you until you go to sleep and then he's the first thing you see in the morning and he's got more stuff for you to do. Did a year of that, went to get purse comp back to Fort Hood. I was so happy because I was going back to Texas. I love Texas. And I went, when I got there, I was running a 13 minute two mile in, in uh, Korea because the air's thin and it's crisp. And it's great, except for the fact that they shoot human waste into the fields that you're running by. That sucks in the summer. Not so bad during the winter. Sucks in the summer. Who shoots human waste? Uh, what they do is uh, the the Korean guys come by to clean out our porta potties, and they will park the truck by the porta potty and suck it out and immediately shoot it right over the road into the rice paddies, which are filled with landmines. You come to find out later. So you do these fun things called landmine runs, and they're exactly what they sound like. Because every year uh, the landmines move, so none of them are marked anymore from the from the uh, Vietnam War, or sorry, from the Korean War, uh, 50 years ago. So none of the landmines are where they were supposed to be. Well, you'd be running, and you look over the side of the road, and there's half a plate sticking out of the road. You're like, what the hell is that? Uh, so in mind, don't worry about it. First run uh, as a unit, uh, we had this brand new officer straight out of OCS. Great guy, the only officer that I actually liked serving under. Uh, we were running and he jumped over this barbed wire fence. I was new. I jumped over with him. Couldn't figure out why everyone else stopped. I can't read Hangul, but I said mines. We got about mm, 75 meters into this run over this fence, and everyone starts yelling, hey, stop. So the LT turns around and was like, what the hell? He's like, sir, you're in a minefield. I may be fat, but I can climb a tree. Very fast, evidently. So they had to send somebody come out, and they did the probing thing to get out to us, and then we left. And, I had the rest of the day off because evidently that will mess with your head a little bit, running into a minefield. Then there was the time that we convinced this big bodybuilder to fire the M2 50 cal machine gun from the hip. <laughs> <laughs> the M2 was never meant to be an individual served weapon. He picked it up and he saw it big and muscly and he's like, yeah. We're like, dude, we will hand you 50 bucks each. Fire one round from me. Seriously? We're like, yeah. Okay. So he grabs a hold of it, puts it on his hip. And we're all just watching. He hits that butterfly uh, trigger and it just disappears. The recoil knocked him backwards. We found the weapon. That was not that bad. Uh, it was buried in the dirt. He was further back, wrapped in uh, undergrowth. We told the medics that he fell down a mountain because it looked like it. Uh, which was funny. As soon as I got to Fort Hood, we were told we were deploying pretty much the same day. It didn't happen like that. We had over a year to train up and prep, but we were told we could deploy any day. We're just waiting on orders. So me and him got to be real good friends and 
drank a lot of beer, and got to be good friends with Texas Roadhouse, which is freaking awesome, especially when you think you're leaving at any point. Um, got assigned with, uh, with a dismount team on Bradley's. I had spent my entire year in Korea learning how to kill tanks. Now I'm climbing out of one. Then they sent us to Iraq. That was the end of March. No, I'm sorry. That was end of February 2003, uh, 2004, rather. Uh, I had been married for two months, and they they uh, we went through all of our briefings and put us on a 747. We got on 747, and the most interesting thing about that was when we got on, uh, they said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry, attention gentlemen, this is Captain So-and-So, flight such and such. Uh, we'd like to ask you that you point the barrels of your automatic rifles towards the floor in case of an accidental discharge. We're like, you will never hear that again being announced on a plane. <laughs> uh, one of my friends had been injured and was being chaptered uh, because he tripped and fell during training and drove a rifle barrel through a skull. He snuck on the plane to deploy with us because our colonel said no. He threw a chair at the colonel and the colonel said you're still not going. He said yes I am. No you're not. Well this had been my battle buddy Wolf from when I first got to Fort Hood and he snuck on right behind me. And I'm a big guy so he just kind of hunkered down and put his Kevlar down so nobody could see him and he sat right beside me. Well, they started calling off names to see who was on the plane, see if anybody was missing. And they called everyone, they're like, wait, there's still one person. Who is that? And they're like, Wolf, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, I'm going and you can't stop me. He had no weapons, but he had his duffel bag with him. So I don't know what he would throw clothes at someone, I don't know. <laughs> so they drug him off the plane, kicking and screaming. He was holding on to every single seat, demanding to de deploy. And they told him no. Uh, so after they got him on the got him off the plane, he was still fighting them all the way across the tarmac. He's like, "Batch is my buddy. I'm going with him. You know, we watch out for each other." And I'm like, "I can I stay with him?" <laughs> and but yeah, he fought him every step of the way, all the way across the tarmac. And that's just the way he is. It was great. And that's uh, cool. It was. And then we flew. All the way to, we stopped off in Ireland for fuel. So technically I got to see Ireland, briefly. Uh, we flew to Kuwait to climatize. Basically climatizing is get used to being hot. Which didn't exactly work because we had really large tents with air conditioning. <laughs> and we were allowed to stay in PTs, shorts and t-shirts. Yeah, we had boonie caps, but we basically hung out. Uh, the only time we left the tent was for chow. We had to carry our weapon with us at all time, but that was about it. Um, anytime we'd have formations, of course, we're all in uniform. And then our colonel started saying, you know, we want to do, we want to see you guys do long runs in uniforms and stuff with weapons. And our platoon leaders like, Roger, yeah, I want to see that too. As soon as he told our team leaders to tell us to do it, he went somewhere else. Our team leader's like, yeah, we're going to do an eight-mile... Go back to the tent, keep the door closed, shut up, and don't come out till it close. <laughs> Roger, so we, we started off on our long run, and we went out and around, and right around the back of the tent, climbed back in, under the tent, and went back to our uh, cot. <laughs> And that's what we did. We had a couple guys who got the brilliant idea of having their name put in Arabic across the back of their booty cap. Those guys have a sense of humor. They wrote things like, uh, uh, shoot me, uh, bullet sponge, camel effort. And the guys didn't know it. They just wore it proudly 
and the only thinking reason it was their name. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know, it, but I didn't have the money to spend because I had a new wife back home who was spending it faster than I could make it. Uh, so I didn't do it, but it was a nifty idea. And I asked one of the interpreters why the hell he was laughing so much every time he saw one of our guys go by. He was like, "Hold on, hold on, I show you." I was like, "Okay." He goes, "That one says I sleep with camels. This one says I have fleas." <laughs> That one says, please shoot me. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously? He goes, yeah, they're screwing with y'all. Y'all don't even know it. <laughs> he said, that's why you should learn the language. Oh, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> I know how to cuss in your language, but that's about it. It's all like, I learned how to say, I'm watching you. Absolutely does not work in Arabic. It's, it's pointless. You never say it. So after a month of that, then we get told we're going to deploy to Iraq. And we're not flying in like everyone else. We're driving in. It's a three-day trip. Yay for us. So the sergeant major comes by and he says, Batch, uh, where are you? Where, uh, where's your truck? I'm like, I'm, I'm over here on this. Like, he said, no, you're not. You're my new gunner. Great. I'm the sergeant major's gunner. He says, I don't care what you do. Don't get my truck shot handle this. So me and my new battle buddy, the Panamanian kid, get put on this truck and then we roll out. But the cool thing about being the Sergeant Major's gunner is you don't have to perform uh, guard detail when you stop for the night to rest because he doesn't want his gunners to be tired. Which was awesome. So we actually got full night's rest. Uh, well, uh, last day in country was uh, April 4th, 2004. Uh, we basically came in from a uh, road march we were guarding a honey truck which is a giant sewer truck that we basically pumped out all their sewage and took it to be disposed of for some reason that those things drew a lot of fire evidently they like shooting at the sewer truck I don't know why I, I'm guessing they liked walking around in ankle deep sewage and you would see we would literally clean up a, a street and you'd see somebody open their window and just dump a trash can or a toilet out the window and it was all over the street and, they don't care. They just dump it. Whatever happens, happens. Uh, Sadr City is a city of about 10 city blocks with about 5 million people in it. That's important. Because when we come back off of patrol, another platoon rolled out to do the same patrol. We all were uh, refilling water, cleaning weapons, catching some sleep if we could. We weren't back for an hour when the call came in that uh, one of our platoons got ambushed. Uh, one of my friends, Sergeant Chen, uh, took a bullet in the head. And were, they were pinned down in an Iraqi house. Basically, they were protecting the Iraqi family from getting shot. They were holding it uh, because their trucks were destroyed. Uh, they were calling for uh, backup, but they were holding position because if they left his family, the house would get destroyed. Uh, retaliation for you know, them letting us in. Uh, so they said, who wants to roll out? And I already had my vest on and my weapon was already clean and had my ammo and everything. I was like, I'll go. So I climbed up in top of the turret of a Humvee and locked in. And, uh, we had we had a couple Humvees, we had a LMTV, and we had a couple Bradleys. Not much because this, this, they just left. Uh, so we rolled out and went rolling into the city. And the first thing I saw was this little girl on a cell phone and she smiled and waved. And of course, me being US Army, I waved back. And we're the Army, nobody messes with us. Yeah, they ambushed them, but we know something's coming, so they're gonna run off because we're the Army. <sighs> Didn't exactly happen that way. Uh, we rolled in, there was no people in the streets, no cars in the streets, no vendors, uh, no animals, nothing. The streets were completely empty. That's never happened. I, I'd only been there for four days, but you kind of pick up the beat of things. Usually around this time, there's people out, there's vendors, and there's nothing. The streets are completely empty. And we're like, um, this doesn't look right. So we're rolling, and we're trying to find our way. But every so often we'd come to a dead end, either tires would be burning or there'd be a car stalled in the road, and so we'd turn around. Um, we got to one point and you start hearing 
gunfire off in the distance. And it's like, well, that's distance. That's not even aimed at us. You know, no big deal. That happens all the time. And we come up to this, the, the end of this intersection. Excuse me. And there's cars burning. We're like, uh oh. So we turn around, and I lean down in the truck. I said, "Okay, sir, uh, what's the first thing that teaches in infantry school?" He said, "Don't go back through a kill box." I said, "What are we about to do?" He said, "Go back through a kill box." I was like, "Yeah, I just wanted to make sure." So we turned around, and we're heading back. We're still trying to find the platoon that's pinned down, and then we started taking fire on our trucks. You just see the rounds bouncing off the trucks from time to time. It's like, and they're yelling, "Shoot back!" But we're trained. Don't shoot unless you have a clear target. You don't want, you know, excess casualties. You don't want collateral damage. And nobody, we're not getting a target presented to us. They're just firing from buildings and rooftops. We have nothing. Uh, so the trucks start getting shot up. Windshields uh, start cracking because even those uh, reinforced windshields splinter. And the trucks started pouring smoke and you see flats, but they're, they have run flats, so it's no big deal. Uh, the LMTV had people in it. The thing about an LMTV is it has no armor plating on the back. So the guys were basically sitting back to back with no protection. Just their body armor, which is nothing. Especially when you can't move. Um, so we started taking heavier fire, and then it was just like everyone in the city was shooting at us. Uh, the vehicles just went down. Um, we were still trying to roll. Uh, the guy who shot me was on a rooftop about 150 feet away. And I didn't even see him at first. I just saw the muzzle flash. And I saw this little black dot coming towards me. And I was like, that couldn't be what I think it is. And I felt my head snap back. And then it was like a light switch got turned on. I just got really angry. I got really pissed. And I had my saw, which has a scope on it, and I just leaned down, clicked over a couple spots on the scope, and, and when he popped his head up to check to see if he hit anything, I put three across his forehead. And I thought, yay, I got him back. And then his friend stood up. And something about his friend standing up just did it. Uh, I dumped an entire drum, 200 rounds, into his two friends, and every window in that upper level because we were taking fire from there and I just I went through six drums of ammo that I had on me uh, and when I finally ran out of ammo uh, I dropped down and I was like I think I'm hit and the uh, other guy in the truck was from LA and he was always told us how he used to run in gangs and how he was gangster As a matter of fact he qualified with his weapon like this <laughs> So he's like, I said, dude, get the gun. He goes, they're shooting us, but you're gangsta, yo. <laughs> <laughs> you should be used to it. You're from L.A. So he climbs up there. He's not up there for 15 seconds. He catches a scratch. He drops back screaming like a little girl. I'm hit. I'm hit. Oh, God, I'm hit. I look at him. You're scratched. I've seen worse shaves. Go back up. And then I blacked out. Uh, when I came to, we were in a security halt. Uh, in an alleyway and uh, I didn't have a weapon and there was no one else in the truck everyone was basically triaging everything so when you got hit where did the bullet hit you? hit me right here right between the eyes um, it missed my helmet it missed my sunglasses dead shot from 150 feet 50 meters technically it shouldn't have even slowed down uh, but it did. It stopped completely. It broke my face and my nose and caused some brain damage and uh, some fun stuff like that. But at the time, all it did was make me mad. And it was just kind of funny. Uh, but we were in security halt. And I got out of the truck and I'm weaving because I have no sense of balance at this point. It just completely screwed up my balance and I still have balance trouble. Uh, and I looked up at him and said, give me your rifle. And he said, no, dude, I need it. You've got my saw. Give me your M16. And he said, no. I said, I'm going to come up there. I'm going to kick your ass. And I'm going to take it from you. And I'm hurt. So I'm really going to kick your ass if you make me climb on that truck. 
it's like, fine. So he hands it to me. And I check it, make sure it's loaded. And I'm having to hold on to the truck to keep my balance because everything's fading in and out. I took my back plate and propped it up on the brush guard of the Humvee so I wouldn't fall. And I was just leaning forward. Um, and medics kept coming by. They're like, hey, you know, are you okay? I was like, yeah, fine. Go take care of everyone else because you can hear people screaming and just, you know, people shot up. And the third time uh, they come by, I collapsed. And they're like, what happened? And they look and there's literally the bullet sticking out of my head. So they opened up my first aid kit and wrapped a bandage around it. And uh, they're like, okay, well, we're going to med back you. It's okay. So they put me in the Bradley. I was in the Bradley maybe 15 minutes when it got hit by two RPGs. One on each side. We had been bitching two weeks before about putting the reactive armor on because that's 80 pound plates. That reactive armor blew off two RPGs and saved us, all of us that was in it. But it sounded like putting your head in a metal trash can and like warping it with a sledgehammer. Um, so, yeah, a 30 ton vehicle rocked. It, it, yeah. And the guy who was driving the vehicle come to find out wasn't even the driver. He just happened to be nearby when we rolled back out. So, uh, while we, we got the wounded and basically piled them all together and we went rolling back we said, you know, we can't do anything, we're out of ammo. Uh, all of us were completely out of ammo. We had no water. Uh, there was an incident where one of our lieutenants had a supply issue and got uh, confused and went to another part of the city with our equipment, which left us with nothing. So we were trying to roll back to, to post to rearm and uh, assess casualties. <laughs> and all you hear from the turret, because the turret is right by my head and they have their screen on so you can hear them. And all you hear is don't jump track, j don't t jump track, because he's making really sharp turns to go through things. And every so often you just run through a house, which is hilarious when you see a toilet from a second story uh, bathroom fall on top of the track. And it's green because that's the camera that's up there. So you just be driving through and all of a sudden you feel this little rock as we punch through a house and then a toilet would fall on top of it. Really surreal. Um, we took some more fire, but we had no ammo. Uh, and we stopped. The captain gets in the back. Uh, because he's coming around to uh, check everything, and our radio was still fine. Uh, his evidently got shot up pretty good. So he's making calls, and he's like, Batch, what happened to you? I was like, oh, I got shot, sir. He goes, cool. You okay? Thanks, so, sir. He goes, okay. Um, where's your weapon? I don't know, sir. He goes, I'll get you one. Hold on. He comes back, hands me the M4. He goes, okay. Anyone comes in here but me or one of us, shoot them. I can do that, sir. It's like, okay, well, um, we're going to cram 12 people back here with you. It holds six. Oh, yeah, we were sitting in each other's laps. And we went rolling out. And we finally got back to base uh, after taking a lot more fire. Uh, later on that evening, we had been gone all day. <coughs> and we all offloaded. And the colonel came by, and he was just checking casualties in the vehicles because all the vehicles were just gone. Uh, I would have hated to be the mechanics on that because they were just chewed up. Uh, he comes over there and he says, "You know, what was what what happened to you?" And I was like, "I got shot in the head, sir." He goes, "Okay, and you're alive." I said, I "Think so, sir." It's okay. Uh, what what weapon do you have? I said, "My saw's on my truck, sir." He goes, "Okay." Well, I'll tell you what, I'll go get you a saw, because we need volunteers to go back out. And I said, I'll go. He said, I'll be right back. So he comes back and puts a saw down at the end of the ramp. He said, if you can walk to it, it's yours, so you can come back out. I took two steps and face planted on the ramp and slid down. He, goes, wow. he said, yeah, you're not going out. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of fuzzy, but from what I understand, I called the uh, MASH NCO Snoopy because that's what he wrote on the band-aid that he put over the bullet. They hit me up with morphine, which meant I 
really, things got f- even fuzzier. <laughs> so I have a brain injury and morphine. Uh, I remember them walking me towards the Blackhawk, but there's those giant mercury, uh, mercury lights that are orange. So I'm stoned, walking towards a Blackhawk with sp- uh, shiny spinning blades in orange light. <laughs> and they're like, watch the blades. I'm like, ooh, pretty. Well, they put me in the back of the Blackhawk. They don't buckle me in. They don't close the door. They just take off. And I, later on, I got told that I technically died on that flight. Um, I woke up being uh, sipped into a body bag, from what I remember. And the girl doing it said, Oh my God, you're alive. I'm like, hi, you're kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, but you're alive. I was like, I'm hearing that a lot lately. <laughs> so they literally picked me up, put me on the backboard, put a neck brace on me, took me into the uh, mash. And for some strange reason, they always want a urine sample. We'd been in a firefight all day long, hadn't had anything to drink. And she's like, I need a urine sample. We're like, man, we haven't drank all day. It's like, I don't care, I still need one. Why? None of us were drinking. We weren't on drugs. There's no steroids here. She said, you can either give me one or I can take it. Well, one of the larger guys who took a bullet in the shoulder, he said, I don't think you're big enough. Said, okay. They pulled the little curtain around him and it looks like they pulled out a fire hose. <laughs> he was a big guy, but he screamed and screamed and screamed and I filled up my cup. <laughs> um, oh man oh yeah it, it does that I wasn't scared of the bullets but that looked like it hurt uh, so the next morning the only reason I know it was morning because when they wheeled us out to the back of the uh, C-130 it was really really bright so they stacked us up like cordwood uh, I think it was like six high uh, all the way down the length of the plane but they were cool about it. They'd come by every so often and say, hey, who needs morphine? And of course you're like, huh, I do. Because you just want to be stoned the whole way and it's fine and morphine's great. Uh, next morning they fly me to Fort Hood uh, where I missed President Bush giving us her Purple Hearts by two hours. They discharged me early on purpose. Um, my now ex-wife, uh, <laughs> She comes and picks me up. I'm like, man, I went from two hot nurses to, hi, honey, <laughs> crap. Uh, then I went before a medieval, and they put me with a shrink who was really cool. I had a crush on her. Uh, and she asked me if I wanted to go back. And, of course, I said, yeah, I want to go back. But over time, as she kept evaluating me, uh, she recommended that I be discharged for her severe post-traumatic stress disorder and post-concussive. So, got discharged um, within seven months of being shot. They literally fast-tracked us. No real counseling, just kind of evaluation and discharge. Um, from there, uh, as soon as I was discharged, my wife asked for a divorce uh, and threw me out of the house. So, I lived in a 30-foot travel trailer in the middle of a field with no power or water for four months. Um, basically, retaught myself to do things. Uh, took my time, got together as much as I could, and went back to school. Finished my degree in criminal justice in 2007. Took a year off. Started working on my master's in psychology in 2008. Late 2008. Uh, fall 2008. Um, basically started a new family, bought a house, still don't go out much, um, still paranoid, still have severe PTSD, still on over a dozen medications. Still paranoid from what? Um, it's hard to explain to somebody without a mental disorder, but something in my head tells me someone's constantly going to jump out from somewhere and do something bad. Um. They tell me that since I did get shot in my frontal lobe that it screwed up a lot of wiring. And I am always antsy. I'm always looking for something to pop up from somewhere. Um, 
at my house, I have range cards set up in front of each window so I can know the distance to each target up front if it comes down to it. Basically, my house has been turned into a military base. I check all the doors, all the windows. I keep track of everything in that house. Um, and basically try to prep for the worst. It's basically being a Boy Scout on steroids. Um, now, I'm working on my master's in psychology so I can kind of understand what I've been through and what I'm going to go through, as well as I have the brilliant idea that um, I'm going to help vets when they come back so that they don't have to go through all this because the VA pretty much lost me for three years. They just kind of forgot I was there. And, uh, no medication, no counseling for three years. I dealt with the nightmares. I dealt with uh, the, the tremors. The, I came off of all my medication at one point. They told me it would kill me. Uh, because my medication just ran out and they, my shrink had quit. So I had nothing and I just detoxed myself. Went through a period of being suicidal. Didn't because of my dog. But what I want to do is help vets so that they don't ever have to go through that. Of, you know, being lost and swept under the rug and forgotten. No one should have to go through that. I'm into that. So, I want to get my PhD in psychology, uh, go to work for either the Army Wounded Warrior Program or the National Organization on Disability. Both uh, groups have helped me a lot, uh, basically, to get, my, get myself on track uh, through either helping me with school or putting a bed in my house. Because at one point I was living in my house with no furniture and a sleeping bag. That's the only thing that was in that house. Uh, but they put a bed in my house, so it made it a home. Now I've got a kid on the way, so I'm crazy and paranoid and a kid. <laughs> uh, his room is decorated with uh, M16 uh, function check posters and Harley Davidson posters. and uh, Yeah, camouflage stuff. And, He's going to be a manly man when we're in the <laughs> But that's pretty much where I'm at and where I'm going is helping other vets because dealing with vets is something that's near and dear to my heart because that's who I am. And matter of fact, I've even joined organizations like the Combat Vets Motorcycle Association that basically escort people who did lose their life in Iraq and Afghanistan, escort them from the plane back to a cemetery or... Yeah. Have you had the opportunity to do that yet? I have. Uh, uh, late last year, there was a uh, ride in Paris. A Marine came home, and uh, basically you had 200 bikes lined up all through Paris, and they had all the flags out. And I had never, even me, I had never felt more patriotic than that moment, sitting in th this line of bikes, and his family was sitting up there with him, uh, with his casket and we all went through Paris and it was just about five miles an hour really slow, really hot but we were escorting him home and I still get you know choked up about that and that's but we don't only do it for the dead whenever the uh, they come in uh, whenever they come in we give them rights we follow them out back to the house and kind of welcome them home and we show up at airports with signs going hi welcome and it's a lot of fun. I, That's I, cool. I tend That's to keep really cool. tied into the veterans community a lot because, like I said, it's my passion. Um, and that these people would do the same if they had existed when I was there um, just means a lot. So, And I know that with the families that I've talked to, is you have crazy people coming out like uh, that Westboro Baptist Church who try to get reactions from families. Uh, by saying that God killed their son or something because of this reason or that one. And basically what we do in instances like that is we get between them and the family so the family doesn't have to deal with them. So it's it's fun. It, it's been a long trip. It's been a lot of interesting stuff. But there's a lot of good mixed in with the really, really messed up stuff. So. Out of your time in the military, what's the, what's the 
most beneficial thing you ever got out of it? Most beneficial thing I ever got out of it? Um, I would say a sense of community. I learned that no matter what happens, as long as somebody's in uniform, they will always have my back. I know I've met other vets that I have nothing in common with, and I know that since they're a vet or they're active duty, I can count on them for my life, and they can do the same. It doesn't matter what war, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, it doesn't matter. Once you've served, you're part of a brotherhood that's thicker than any family because you will die for that other person, and you know they will for you too. It's just who we are.